Buenas tardes, es un placer para nosotros. Bienvenidos a este webinar que estamos organizando en colaboración con nuestros buenos amigos americanos para analizar esta situación de los power shortages inducidos por eventos climáticos. We are going to switch to English because we are doing this webinar in English because our friends, our people who are participating are coming from the States and here David Robinson, as you know him. Well, it's a pleasure having all of you here in this climate-induced power shortages in California and Texas, lesson learned. We are seeing more and more problems in this, this kind uh, worldwide and this is the extreme events related to climate. It's a big influence in the, in the grid, this kind of thing. And I thank our friends to participate in this uh, webinar. Um, David Robinson, Ferdinand Sjorsen Hasri, Ross Balwit, and David Alvira. It's a pleasure of having all of you here. Well, we are uh, trying to make this webinar uh, 45 minutes after this. Uh, 15 minutes of organization. I'm going to introduce our guests. Our guests, very sometimes very well known with with us. Uh, the first of them is Feridor Sosanchi. He's uh, very well known here in Spain. He's a friend of us. He worked in Pijani for many years. He knows very well the Spanish market too. He's the president of Menlo. Uh, Menlo system and uh, he is very involved of all this demand response, all this uh, kind of uh, success related to uh, climate uh, events. Uh, you can you can see him after this. After this, we will have Ross Balway. This is the first time we have him in this uh, webinar. He's a professor in Texas in Texas uh, University, in Austin. Ross, it's a pleasure having you here. It's a pleasure having you remark here. He worked for many years in, in, in Berkeley Laboratory. He was uh, a postdoctoral fellow at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. He was an assistant professor at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. And he knows uh, very well because he has a grant here in Europe many years ago, but he knows very well the electric, European electrical system. Uh, he is with us to, to talk about the uh, last event since January in Texas related to the climate. Thank you, Ross, for coming in this uh, uh, webinar. The third one is David Alvira Baeza. David, muchas gracias. He is the uh, joined Jerez Electrica in 1993, where he has been working in many departments, all in operation. He is an expert on all this area of operation. Now he's involved of those these issues related with the head of the warranty of supply department. He knows very well all the things related to the operation of the grid, uh, the European grid, uh, the Spanish grid. Uh, he, he knows very well the event in January related to Filomena in Spain and Europe. And he's going, thank you, David, David, for participating in this, in this webinar too. The last one, but not the least, is David Robinson. Eh? David Robinson, no? he knows Spanish very well. He's the uh, a fellow of Oxford for many years. He worked in the consultancy. Now he worked in all these areas. He is uh, an expert in regulatory system, uh, talking about flexibility, flexibility, talking about the demand response, about all the things you can see about it. David, thank you for coming. This is not the first time you are here, and this will not be the last one. And the fifth will be Pablo de Juan, you know him, and if you have any question, you can send to Pablo whatever you want, or you can put your own question in this uh, uh, this uh, preguntas y respuestas in the, in the system, or you can send to an email to uh, pablo.dejuan.enerclub.es. Okay, we are going to start this uh, webinar. We will start with uh, Feridon. He is going to present the uh, system and sometimes the, maybe the problems it was in California in the last uh, August with these uh, fires 
And after this, we are going to pass to Ross. Ross is going to present or going to introduce us in this uh, situation in January this year in Texas, very well known in all in the newspaper around the world at that time. And the third uh, will be David Alvira. He's going to introduce the operation system, the Spanish network in January in these uh, extreme events we have seen in Madrid and all around Europe. At, uh, at, at the end, we will uh, introduce uh, David Robinson with the, the, the general picture about the um, regulation, about the things you, we will need to control all this event if we can control that. Okay, we are going, I'm going to give the floor to Ferry. It's a pleasure having you here, Perry, good friend. You, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everyone in Spain. It's lovely to be back and have this opportunity to speak and uh, present. I, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Pablo to advance my slides so if he could uh, share the screen. Here we go. Thank you very much. Uh, you, can, you can go to the next and uh, I just want to thank uh, Inner Club again. This is the second time that I've done a webinar and I've also done in-person presentations and I can tell you that I, I would love to come back in person to beautiful Madrid and see everyone live and well and uh, do this in person rather than uh, virtually. But uh, given the circumstances, I think this is the best we can do right now. But thank you very much for organizing and I see quite a few people, I guess uh, 60 or so uh, already signed up. Uh, so it's, it's a good crowd. I'm happy to be involved. So what we're going to do today, uh, to start with, we're going to talk about two recent episodes of basically power shortages, which resulted in rolling blackouts. One was a year ago in uh, California in mid-August 2020. As you remember, it was a very hot August and we had forest fires and uh, COVID and everything else. That uh, episode was embarrassing, but it was short-lived compared to what happened in February in Texas. That one was extensive and expensive, has turned into a big political and financial disaster, I might say, uh, had resulted in resignations of everybody at the ERCOT, which is the grid operator. And um, of course, uh, the second speaker, Ross, is in Texas, and he's going to tell us more about what happened there. So what, what we're going to do, or at least what I'm going to do, is briefly talk about what happened in both these cases very briefly talk about some of the similarities and differences. And then the last two speakers, of course, will try to draw some lessons for Europe and, and Spain in particular. So that's kind of the agenda for today. If you can go to the next slide. Yes, I think what I want to say is that what we're seeing is climate change in, in action. This is a slide from the forest fires last year in California and this year, we are already expected to have uh, a very dry and potentially very hot uh, summer again, both in Texas and California. So who knows uh, what, what we'll expect. The next slide shows the, uh, the snowstorm that was unusual for Texas, maybe not uh, in other parts of the world, but uh, this is, a, this is an example of what happens in a state that is not used to having several inches of snow and uh, freezing temperatures for an entire week. And the next slide shows what happened just fairly recently in uh, Australia, in, uh, in New South Wales. They had basically 100 year floods that they were totally unexpected uh, flooded uh, whole regions of the state and had heavy, heavy rain. So I think there's some 
pattern that we are beginning to see more extreme weather more frequently and uh, that obviously has a very important implication for the uh, for the grid and the uh, demand so the next slide basically is what i'm going to talk about is what happened in california independent system operator august of 2020 and i'll just explain a few of the basic facts in the given amount of time that i have so if you can go to the next slide what everyone uh, i'm sure has heard more than once is this phenomena which we call in, in in here we call it the california duck it's basically this daily cycle of the sun rising in the morning and what it does is the net load that the grid operator sees has been dipping lower and lower as you see the belly of the duck and then when the sun sets the grid operator has to make up that 13 or 16 gigawatts of solar energy that disappears and that's the the neck of of the duck curve which has been a big problem for many years and it's getting worse as you can see in this chart and the next slide essentially shows shows the same thing uh, the evening ramp which is what happens when that orange portion disappears when the sun sets and you have to replace it with thermal generation and imports from other states and so California ISO has been handling this with increasing difficulty over the years but what happened in August essentially they sort of fumbled this period where the one goes down and the other one has to come up they misjudged uh, what was going to happen and that resulted in the shortages that resulted in the blackouts and so forth the next slide shows essentially what i think was the fundamental reason which is was, was an extremely hot uh, period in california you can see the 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 purple area there was 32 million people in almost all of California and parts of uh, neighboring states that were suffering from what was an extreme and extended heat wave. So it wasn't just one part of California and it wasn't just California, but the whole region was, was extremely hot. And so that produced demand, which was above the range that California ISO normally is able to handle and the next slide essentially shows that um, the orange is the 2020 uh, and the other one the blue is the 2015 and you can see that we have these episodes where temperatures are very high but usually only for a day or two in 2020 what happened is we had an entire week where temperatures were extremely high uh, for uh, extended period of time and I think on average California was 10 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than what would have been normal and so that that was really the fundamental cause of, of the shortage and the next slide uh, shows the extent of the outage these are the three large utilities you can see southern california edison pg and e in san diego how many customers were affected and how long so the the short story the the summary is that the extent of the shortages was about a gigawatt in a system that was like 40 gigawatts at a time and it only lasted somewhere between 15 to 15 minutes to two hours so demand response could have made a huge difference whereas in the case of texas as, as uh, ross will explain it was much more extensive and extended it more or less went on for four days and i think demand response would have been far far more of a challenge to handle that kind of an episode the next slide shows that California, of course, the 
is the independent system operator is limited to the state of California, but it has connections to the neighboring states, which is different in the case of Texas, which is essentially operated as, a, as an island. So it has limited capacity to import and export. But again, if the whole region is hot, then the neighbors don't have extra capacity to, to send to California, which is essentially what happened in this case. And the next slide, Basically, uh, to summarize, I think what, what happened in, in very short is it was unusually hot. The grid operator essentially fumbled the duck curve, which has been a problem, but you know, most days and most years, they, they, don't, they don't seem to have problems handling it. There are some similarities to Texas, and I think, uh, I'm not going to say a lot about it, but I think it, it's fair to say that what happened in California was not or could not be blamed to solar. Solar did what solar does. You know, the sun rises in the morning and sets in the, in the evening. And there's nothing surprising about that. And I think the same could be said about Texas. The renewables uh, could not really be blamed, uh, I, I, as far as I know, for what happened in either case. And the next slide also talks a little bit about um, some similarities and differences between the two states. In both California and ERCOT, that those are energy-only markets. We don't have a formal capacity market. In California, there is something called RA, which stands for uh, resource adequacy. So we have a regulatory mandated resource adequacy requirement, but obviously in this case it did not work very well. ERCOT, as Ross will explain, allows the, the bid prices to rise to $9,000 per megawatt hour, and that is intended to provide sufficient incentives for generators to supply power in, in as needed. But again, in this case, it, it did not work and, and Ross will explain to us why that is the case. The next slide, uh, and Ross may, may, may explain this more, is what happened. This shows what happened in Texas in case of, uh, you can see it on the February uh, 15th, what happened with loads and, and, load and uh, demand and supply and how it fell short. And the next slide also shows, and these are all available. You can look it up at the uh, ERCOT website. If you can go to the next slide, I believe it shows the uh, what happened to different resources during, during the extreme weather. And finally, and I think this was very important, the last slide in my presentations shows the prices in Texas. Prices, jumped to the peak, which was $9,000 per megawatt hour, and stayed at a very high level for an extended period of time, which explains why uh, some people who were on time of use rates and so forth got to extremely high bills. And that this also resulted in some financial issues for uh, many, of the, uh, many of the participants in the markets. So I'm going to uh, stop at this point, and uh, hopefully this is a good lead-in to what uh, Ross is going to say. Okay, thank you very much, Perry. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, it's an outstanding presentation. You are invited to come here, whatever you want. You know, uh, you know that. And we are going to give you, you explain the overall situation and the differences between uh, California and Texas, and we are going to give the floor to Ross. Ross, are you here? Yes, sir. Let me start my video. And Maybe I will you can to... start with your video. You have some problems. You can uh, turn off your video and you can continue with uh, something with it. Okay, go ahead. Perfect. Perfect. So let me, let me uh, start the presentation. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. You, you can the screen, uh, complete the screen. As uh, very uh, indicated, we okay, had in Texas, in Urquhart, uh extreme weather in uh, February. 
Uh, Arcadio, you mentioned January, uh, Philomena. We also had called on from Philomena or from the similar effect of the jet stream, and I will return to that at the end of the presentation. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the weather context, uh, the electricity demand. Perry's already touched on this, uh, the implications of the role of blackouts, uh, the reasons. Uh, I'll repeat some of Perry's uh, thoughts about some market prices. Uh, and then I'd like to uh, try to suggest some uh, wider relevance. I am going to go, I am going to switch off my video, I think, because I think my uh, uh, internet connection is not the, uh, the best. So, uh, let's think of the weather context. Uh, I think many people know that Texas has high sun temperatures, it's a lot. Have many days over 38 degrees Celsius, and uh, generation asset owners respond to that by weatherizing for summer. We could say that the generation plan is summerized. Uh, but Texas, less well known, also occasionally has extreme cold. We've had extreme cold maybe months, decade since the 19th century. Uh, and however, uh, it's true to say that our infrastructure, that includes both the natural gas supply, electricity generation, and the water system, all of those infrastructures are less well weatherized. And it's perhaps no surprise because uh, extreme cold is on once in a day. So we could go, uh, Texas generation system, electricity system is well summarized. It's not very well winterized. And this is despite the fact that after our last extreme cold, which was in 2011, there were uh, a bunch of recommendations that were uh, uh, relating to how to weatherize for the winter. Uh, it seems that not all of those recommendations were taken on board. But uh, certainly, uh, it's not only the electricity system itself, but the electricity demand is affected by low temperature. Uh, prior to 2021, prior to this February, uh, the uh, ERCOT was always a summer peaking region and always summer peaking by a long way. The summer peaks have been bigger than 70 gigawatts since 2015. Uh, and they're currently about 75 gigawatts. The blue bars on my graph there show the winter peak demand. And what you can see is that up until 2021, all of the winter peaks have been below and in fact, well below 70 gigawatts. Uh, you can also see that the winter peaks are more variable. That reflects the fact that we occasionally have severe winter weather. The, the rightmost bar, 2021, the blue bar, was the highest demand actually served, which was about 69 gigawatts. But the red extension shows what the demand would have been had there not, the peak of the demand had there not been curtailment. And that peak would have been about 74 gigawatts. In other words, about the same as the summer peak. The red bar you can see literally goes right off the chart. It's right past what anyone I think might have predicted as a reasonable uh, even cold winter. So we had very, very cold weather, not unprecedented, but not really part of what people are planning for on a typical basis. Uh, there had been extreme cold uh, outages of all of our generation resources, nuclear, gas, coal, and wind. And then during the blackouts, there were fur outages. We also had situations where the gas supply to the gas fire generation was reduced. Uh, to a large degree, it appears because of freezing of water out of gas lines, causing those lines to not be usable. So between February 15 and 18, as Perry mentioned, we had a large amount of forced outages, about 35 gigawatts of forced outages and rates by I mean, the generator not being able to operate at full capacity. Out of a total of 107 gigawatts of nameplate, that includes about 25 
gigs, gigawatts of uh, wind and several gigawatts of solar. So uh, the thermal, we're talking about 80 gigawatts. And there was up to about 20 gigawatts of load shed, a very significant load shed in the context of a 75 or 74 gigawatt peak. Limited capacity from other regions in Texas. They're on uh, high voltage DC ties and other asynchronous uh, links. But it was very cold, not just in Texas, but also throughout most of the interior of the United States. And in fact, the surrounding regions also had rolling blackouts. And in fact, Texas imports of energy from, of electricity from other regions was reduced during the blackout. We had many, many people uh, blacked out. Many distribution feeders were outaged almost continuously for several days. I was in the middle of that. My home was blacked out for all but about 90 minutes over 59 hours, which was very important, I have to tell you. Um, so what caused this? Well, the was the extreme cold. And more specifically, it was what we might call a common mode cause of both high demand and failures in electricity, natural gas, and water infrastructure. And I think it's important to recognize that these sort of common mode causes of multiple failures or multiple effects on demand are not very well treated in our traditional reliability metrics for electricity and our traditional predictive methods for understanding reliability. Why is that? Because typically those traditional methods, production costing, uh, outage simulation, assume independent outages. Here we've got a common mode that is causing a lot of failures simultaneously or near simultaneously. Without a doubt, this cold caused significant inconvenience. It killed a number of people, uh, some of whom directly related uh, to the cold, some of whom indirectly due to interruption of their electricity supply. What happened to sell market prices? First, I need to reiterate Perry's comment that in the ERCOT is an energy and ancillary services only market. This is similar to the Australian market and to the Alberta market, but is quite unusual compared to most other US markets and to European Union markets. Uh, insofar as there's no capacity market and no requirements on uh, load serving entities to have uh, uh, generation capacity under contract. And indeed, capital formation and contracting is on the basis of expectations about occasional high prices. Um, ERCOT also has a short-term forward day market like most other US markets. It's different to the day ahead market in place in the European, European Union. In particular, it's not quite like Euthemia, for example. Well, this energy only market has been criticized, but I think it's fair to say that it was sufficient to motivate summarization, in other words, good preparation for summer weather, but it's apparently, perhaps obviously, not been sufficient for winterization, not only of the electricity infrastructure, but also the gas and the water infrastructure. So as I mentioned, we have no capacity market in ERCOT. This is different to other US markets where they either have a capacity market to procure capacity or like California have retail obligations. Capacity markets are touted as possibly uh, uh, being uh, how we might have avoided uh, this uh, extreme, extremely bad situation. Indeed, they include penalties for not being available at peaks and that typically motivates firm gas contract and dual fuel capabilities. I'll point out that several firm gas contracts were reneged by the gas suppliers. The gas suppliers uh, called a contractual term called force majeure and said, sorry, we don't have gas. So it's not clear to me that a capacity market would have been sufficient to prevent the problem we had. And it's not clear that the terms in a capacity market would have been sufficient for a multi-day extreme event as we experienced 
uh, in, in ERCOT. The pulse of prices were at the off the cap for several, for several days during the blackouts. That's, the market is not intended to operate like that. And indeed, there is a so-called circuit breaker that's designed to lower the offer cap in, in order to avoid excessive wealth transfers. In fact, this circuit breaker was triggered, but it was ineffective because uh, it turned out that the lower offer cap was based on a large multiple of gas prices. And because there were gas prices, the gas prices were also high. So there are certain things that we need to fix, uh, in particular this circuit breaker, because that caused quite a significant amount of uh, wealth transfer that very few residential customers are exposed to these prices, but many commercial and industrial customers are at least partly exposed. A couple of people have gone bankrupt because they weren't appropriately hedged. What's the wider relevance of this uh, event? Extreme cold might not be a problem in places that already uh, experience cold, but common mode phenomena are relevant to high supply conditions everywhere. Uh, and societal risk tolerance for common mode phenomena, I think, is likely to be much lower than what uh, market participants are likely to want to uh, be comfortable with on a uh, profit and loss basis. I think that tells us that we have an important role for regulation and standards to handle such phenomena. And we might say that it's somewhat analogous to various other standards we have in the electricity industry, such as low voltage ride through requirements. So uh, with that, I would uh, like to uh, and uh, move on to the next uh, speaker. Thank you very much. And I would like to add my uh, thanks uh, to Interclub for inviting us to participate today. Thank you, Ross. Thank you, Ross. I think there are it's, it come out many questions about this, and maybe in the Q and A session we can you can attend these these things. Uh, I think we can hear a little bit noisy to you, but thank you. Uh, we are going to the next guest. I'm going to introduce David Alvira. I thought uh, about her before. David, can you put your camera on? David, the Red Electrica. Is going to explain the uh, how can they manage the Spanish grid and the European grid in January. This is the or oh, whatever. Okay, David, your floor okay. is yours. Thank you, Arcadio. Um, let me share some slides. Even at the beginning, I will. Let's see. Share. Okay. Here. Is okay. 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 So, um, well, um, I was asked to try to see, to, to introduce a European perspective to... David, tienes dos uh, dispositivos, no sé, tienes que cambiar. Ah, sí. sí, espera. <laughs> Yo no sé cómo se hace, pero se puede hacer. <laughs> sí, un momento, voy a, voy a salir de aquí y lo que voy a hacer es directamente... Mira, a ver. Ponlo en, en pantalla completa, ¿no? Ay, vamos a ver el directo. Bueno, no te preocupes. Si le das a... ¿Me eh, oís ahora? Ahora está ¿Sí? muy bien. Venga. Dale. Vale, es que he desenchufado a la bestia y... Okay, sorry for that. Uh, I start again. So I was asked to give a European perspective of uh, what could happen in, in Europe with a similar incident as those that happened in California and, and Texas and that were presented a few minutes ago. So it's, it's difficult to know in advance if Europe is better prepared. But, um, well, I think I can give you some ideas which are not complete, but can give us an idea if, if we're in a different position. I, I focus most, mostly on Europe and a little bit on Spain, but uh, I will focus mainly in Europe, in global. 
So, uh, so the first thing we can we can do is, as uh, Arcadio said, we can take a look to um, to the to the event we had on the okay to the event we had the eighth of of uh, January. You know, and in those days, seventh, eighth, ninth, we had Philomena in Europe. The the temperatures were very cold compared to to average temperature. Uh, particularly in Spain, we had a lot of snow in places where they were not used to to have a snow at all. Actually, in Madrid, we had more than half a meter of a snow, which is completely unusual, and we had traffic block for many days. You know? so so the situation was was unusual. Uh, the markets cope with it. I mean, the, the price went very high, not nine thousand dollars per megawatt, but very high. Uh, but the security supply was was maintained, and and the supply was maintained even if uh, at a high price. On the eighth of January, where the the demand was very high in the west western part of Europe, while in the eastern part uh, was much less was was uh, because of not only because the the temperature was much more mild but also because it was holiday in, in some places. So there was a lot of flow going from east to west. And this, uh, well, tightened a little bit some, some uh, connections between countries, but everything was more or less okay until we had a, some uh, trip, some uh, uh, protection act acting. And there was, a, uh, uh, let's say, a cascade event. We separate Europe in two parts. But uh, in line with what uh, um, was said by the first speaker, uh, there was a demand side uh, that could couple could could handle this this issue. Actually, some interruptible demand was cut mainly in France and Italy, and uh, this prevent the event from going any farther. Uh, is this good enough to believe in Europe we are much better? I'm not really so sure. No? Uh, these events, which are very, very rare, uh, they're different to, I mean, they're difficult to, to take into account when you are dimension, dimensioning a, a system because you cannot dimension the system for event that's going to have a probability of one in 30 years or in 50 years because that's completely inefficient. So at the end, uh, when you when you have a system like European system or like US, USA system, uh, hopefully the 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 rare event and, and catastrophic event does not cope does not cover all the system and covers part of the system. So at the end, uh, probably the only option to try to to stand this sort of events is to believe that most of the times the event is not going to cover the full system and then try to build a, enough collaboration uh, tools to cover these, these situations. So in the case of Europe, the first thing we have uh, is that we have an advantage in terms of size. Now these figures I put there, they're very approximate. Uh, please don't use them for anything. Just to know that in US states and, and Europe, more or less, the generation capacity is similar. The demand, the peak demand is similar. Well, the, 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 the one in the United States is a little, it's a little less because it's, we have different, different uh, time zones, while in Europe is mainly one time zone. The transmission lines is more or less the same, but the size is, is double in the United States. So, so our neighbor that could help us is much closer in Europe. So it's much easier that with this higher uh, generation density, we are going to have that that uh, help. Of course, it's not the same in all Europe. In the center is is the connection is much better. Uh, the countries like Spain that were in the periphery, uh, we have a different situation, and it's not so. Sometimes it's not so easy uh, because uh, to get help in the, in the case of Iberian Peninsula, Portugal and Spain, uh, we're going to have it only through the through the interconnection with France, which is around 3.5 uh, gigawatts, compared to a demand of Portugal and Spain of around 50 gigawatts. So 
it's very small the the the, the, the um, support we're going to receive from our neighbors, no? but it's there actually. One of the clues I think for for these collaborations, and and I think this is different from uh, between Europe and the United States, is the fact that European regulation uh, is much stronger in the sense that. Right now, most of the electrical regulation we're getting, it doesn't come from the nations, it comes from the European Union. So uh, actually, most of the, of the new regulation I get in the electrical system is not a Spanish uh, regulation, it's European regulation that is translated to Spain in some maybe specific aspects. That, that uh, takes us to a much closer way of work uh, for normal states, for emergency states, and for any kind of uh, any any situation. And then another thing that I have you have to take in, into account very much is the fact that uh, most of Europe is synchronous. And, and of course, if you have a problem in a synchronous area, uh, at the end you can that the, the problem can propagate much faster. So at the end we all collaborate very much because it's our system, the one who is in risk. No, in, in the case of, of the event in the 8th of January, one of the important things during the evolution of the, of the event is the fact that uh, we, have, we have signaling that we receive signs from other countries. And in, for example, if you go to the control center here, close by to my place uh, in Spain, and you see the, the big mimic, you have a site where there's a European, um, European map, and it usually is in green. If a country has a trouble, it turns into a different color. And when the trouble is important, it gets red very fast. And in that moment, even if you don't see any signal in your country, you say, well, something's going to happen. I mean, something has already happened somewhere, and it can reach me very fast. So that worked uh, very good in, the, in January the 8th, and this system, uh, which is called the Ensoy Awareness System, the app, the S, uh, well, uh, prevent, I mean, already tell the countries that were not involved in the first moment that something could happen, and it did happen, no? And then, of course, uh, the, what I was saying, uh, and, and also uh, multilateral and bilateral agreements that probably are, are, are closer or more similar to the United States, no? Then very recent uh, for this rare uh, extreme natural hazards, uh, we had some regulation that was approved in 2019 and that we're now uh, developing and getting to the, to the details. Uh, last year we, were, we, we did all the assessment of different situations where we're going to consider and right now we're building the plans. Uh, so in this, in this, uh, all, in this, all this assessment, uh, we're taking into account situations which are, which are very, very um, rare, uh, with very, very low uh, probability, but with high impact. And then here, okay, again, we can, uh, we're doing everything European-wise, so we can uh, try to get a solution uh, that's European-wise, and for that reason, maybe can be implemented while uh, something the same with the same probability, very local, is, is not efficient at all to, to be implemented. And, and lastly, I want to get in connection with one of the issues that Ross was mentioning about energy systems, energy, energy markets. You know, in, in, in Europe, uh, we are now in, uh, in uh, Europe in um, energy market also. Uh, capacity mechanisms, uh, they exist, but they're uh, very, uh, they're seldom and, and, and usually they're very, uh, how can I say, they're not very like it, let's say, but the tool is there. Right now in Spain, for example, we don't have a capacity ma a market, a capacity mechanism, but in the European uh, re uh, regulation, there is a space for this. So if, we, if you start to do uh, adequacy assessments in midterm and you see that things are going wrong, for example, that's not the case now in Spain because we have a lot of capacity, but uh, some capacity is, is closing down like uh, coal power generators. And then we can reach in the next years a situation where adequacy is not so clear. 
In that case, if we, if we uh, let's say, um, we are able to show that this is happening, then we can build a, a capacity mechanism to cover this situation. And, and those uh, mechanisms uh, will hopefully be able to uh, cover some of these uh, strange and rare and, and very little probable situations. Well, and this is what I had prepared is, and of course, any, any question you have, I might, I'll be happy to try to answer. Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, it's uh, my presentation. Now I'm going to give the floor to David Robinson. Maybe you can uh, close the sharing of uh, your screen, and David. Yes, sorry. David, open your camera. Trying to. Okay. There David, we... I think you are going to give a wrap up. What do we need about the regulation to avoid this kind of situation? Yeah. No, this is your main issue. Thank you. Yeah. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different perspective. I'm going to start on the understanding that we're trying to have a net zero. Uh, energy system. So it's not just a question of coping in the next couple of years. It's it's asking, you know, what what kind of system are we going to need to build? What kind of, or put differently, what public policies, what markets, what regulation are we going to need? And I'm I'm going to assume that what that, that at least two of the major challenges ahead are going to be the intermittency of of renewables, which will be the dominant uh, sources of energy in the system. And as well as um, you know the the increasing um, frequency of of uh, extreme weather events, um, I'm going to argue that essentially what we're talking about here, and Arcadio, you you predicted that I was going to talk about this, and you were right. It has to do with decarbonized flexibility. How are we going to actually balance the system when most of the energy is renewable, um, and when uh, we are also facing these sorts of of, of uh, extreme weather events. I'm going to talk first about the need, then about what resources uh, could provide that flexibility, um, and then talk about some of the enablers, both in terms of markets, uh, specifically to do with demand flexibility, but then more generally about system planning and, and governance. Um, I, again, why do we need decarbonized flexibility? Well, I think, first of all, we need it to keep the lights on. I mean, today we've spoken about California and Texas, and Essentially, we were talking about, about blackouts. Um, this can be short term as it was in California or very long term as it was in, in, in Texas. But we also have to be thinking about uh, excess renewable output. So we're not just talking about shortages. We're talking about surplus of renewables that if we don't, if we don't uh, find a way to absorb them, will either be wasted or can create systems uh, instability problems. So we've got that. Uh, element of flexibility. It's not just downwards, it could be upwards as well in terms of demand. And then we've also got the objective of, of, um, of if you want, of flexibility, which helps to, we've got competing sources of flexibility, which can help to reduce the cost of balancing. Because as renewable penetration rises, we've seen in, in all countries that the cost of balancing rises too. Also, the flexibility helps to limit price spikes. So there's all sorts of reasons why we want and need uh, flexibility, and, it, and it's going to have to be decarbonized as we move to a net zero system. So then, what you know, we need it. So what resources can provide decarbonized flexibility? As I say, traditionally, almost all the flexibility in the system came from fossil fuels, um, with a little bit of demand flexibility from large consumers, a little bit from um, from storage like pump storage in the U in in, in Spain. But fossil fuels are disappearing. So, you know, in, in, in Texas, they disappeared because they froze. But we're talking about what happens if they permanently disappear? Where is it going to come from? Where is the flexibility going to come from? Well, part of it will come from decarbonized firm generation, maybe with using biomethane or biofuels, possibly hydrogen. Um, that may well be large scale centralized generation. We're also going to be increasingly relying on storage could be pump storage, increasingly it will be battery, batteries, compressed air, 
many other technologies now being discussed, it will come from networks. The networks themselves have technologies which, which enable the whole system to be more flexible, but also networks take us to the interconnector or interconnectors and can provide sometimes if the surrounding systems don't have exactly the same problems we have, they can, they can help as well. Um, and finally, we've got flexible demand, which is what I usually talk about, but here we're, we're going beyond that. But we're talking especially about demand flexibility from EVs, from heat pumps, smart plugs, smart devices of all, all sorts. And usually this flexible demand is sort of net load on the system also includes some kind of generation. So we often have combinations, which you know often refer to as distributed energy resources, which can provide flexible demand. So the, in other words, there's a number of different resources. Um, the question is, how do we tap them? How do we enable their development so that they can help us to cope with these changes, both the short term ones and the longer term ones? Um, let, let me start with some that are important for flexible demand, and then I'll broaden it out to talk about planning and governments. First of all, we need to think about markets. And, you know, I go along with Alfred Kahn, who was one of my mentors and, and the chairman of the New York um, Public Service Commission, saying that if a market will do it, use a market. But sometimes it doesn't. But where it does, it's really important, if you want flexible demand, to give access to all the, all the demand to those markets. So start by opening access to all markets, not just to large customers and generators, but also to all, all, all the demand. Also start thinking about new products. In the UK during COVID, the demand fell a lot, but renewables continued to generate literally much more than the demand needed. And so they had to, so the, the, the system operator developed a new product, which was a, a which essentially encouraged consumers to consume more or to or to store it. So the idea is we're going to need new products in existing markets. And we're also going to need um, new kinds of markets. I mean, uh, I'll come to capacity markets in a minute, but I think there's a widespread understanding that since most of the new resources are happening on the distribution network, um, we were go we're going to need, at the very least, markets to to um, to manage the congestion on those networks. So I know that in Spain there are a number of of um, pilot projects being developed to to develop to 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 encourage, if you want, the the creation of a of a, a congestion market at local level. There may well be energy markets at a local level. And, and then we may well have a capacity market in future. I'm not a great fan of capacity markets for various reasons, which I'm happy to explain. But I do think that, um, that it's important to keep them open as an option. As a, if the system doesn't have enough, enough capacity and no one's investing, then in my view, the market isn't working well and one may well need to use what is essentially a centralized auction system to bring forth uh, um, resources. In that case, I would strongly argue that all resources, both storage, generation, networks, interconnector, access to foreign, if you want, outside generation and demand flexibility, all of these resources should be competing in the capacity market. I'll come back to that in a minute when we talk about system planning and governance. So we've got markets, new kinds of markets, access to existing ones, as well as, as new products. Tariffs should be designed to encourage flexible consumption. In particular, uh, tariffs are commercial offerings which encourage consumption when renewables are actually available and discourage it when the renewables aren't. Because if they're not available, it may be very much more expensive, um, flexible generation. We need business models and technologies which are helping consumers to be uh, participate in these markets often automatically without any need for them to be actively you know making decisions uh, we're talking about aggregators we're talking about platforms that are creating virtual power plants these are already being developed in different countries but we've got to promote those technologies and business models and change markets so that these these new players can play we also need policy support for consumer resilience i mean we're talking about consumers in their homes um, and if the system is down and they don't have, you know, good insulation, they don't have any alternative to electricity, then this is a problem. So we also be, be thinking about home improvement, perhaps local storage, um, uh, solar thermal storage, other, other ways in which consumers can cope if the, if the situation gets extreme. 
and i think we have to test and support demand flexibility with we call them in the u k. regulatory sandboxes, incubators, testing these ideas. and that's enough for flexible demand. let me sort of open it up a little bit more to the broader question of system planning and governance i think there are definitely going to be some policy decisions that markets are not going to make um in i think in most countries the issue in europe now is you do you or do you not develop a hydrogen business should it be blue hydrogen based upon natural gas with ccs should it be green based upon uh, upon you know renewable energy and electrolysis These sorts of decisions are not going to just be taken by markets they're going to require policy decisions about the development of networks which are going to have to be coordinated so i think we have to be making those sorts of decisions when it comes to um, capacity markets or the development of these different resources if we do have a capacity market i think we have to be thinking about integrating not just have a capacity market for firm energy another market for renewables and a third market for networks or no market for networks we have to combine all of these i i've seen in australia a recent um auction where those three three components renewable energy networks to connect them and firming energy were all being auctioned at the same time because they're all integrated okay so i think we have to think again about about how one uh, does develop these combinations of different parts of the system um, and i think also we have to think about governance now networks are now competing with flexible generation and with storage and with demand response to provide flexibility so what we've seen in the uk is that the system operator is now separate from the network uh, in, in at the transmission level. I think we have to be thinking whether one wants to do it through ownership or regulation to make sure that the system operator who's going to be making key decisions about long-term planning and investment of the system and of course operating it has no special interest in, you know, if you want favoring a an affiliated network. It doesn't mean there hasn't isn't going to be close coordination. We know there has to be, but I think it's important to recognize that the system operator has responsibilities and it has to we have to avoid conflicts of interest. Um, I think we also need to think about different energy market designs. And you know, the fact that so many countries are now uh, convinced that they need the capacity markets is because the energy only market doesn't work. We have to rethink energy markets so that capacity markets, you know, which are cent centralized auctions aren't necessary. They seem to be necessary now because the energy markets don't work. So we have to be thinking about new forms of energy markets. As some of you know, I have my own views on that, but I think that's a debate has to take place. So conclusions. I think that what we're seeing in Texas, what we're seeing in California is extremely helpful as a glimpse of the sorts of problems that we're going to have to face. But much more serious than in, in California and in Texas, they're, we're going to have to do it without fossil fuels. So we've got to think hard about how one is going to plan, operate, what role markets have, what more regulation has, how we develop new business models, and above all, how we get consumers and distributed energy resources actively participating in this. Um, so if there's one general message, I think we have to move beyond trying to improve the system to be thinking about a new system. And I, I think about it the way I think about internal combustion engine versus electric vehicles. You know, we can, the internal combustion engine can always be improved, but at the end of the day, we want an electric vehicle. So trying to improve the existing system is like fixing, improving the internal combustion engine. I think we now have to come up with the electricity or energy system equivalent of the electric vehicle, which is a completely different system based upon 21st century technology and economics and not based upon 20th century technology and economics. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David. We knew that you are a very fan of the uh, markets and we will have a very long way ahead to establish the right market for the future. No, this is the uh, maybe the conclusion for your presentation. And now we have 15 minutes to Q&A session and maybe I give, I'm going to give the Pablo the word. There are several questions for all of you. Mm -hmm. Pablo? Yeah. You, are you there? Okay. Yeah, I'm there. Okay. Thank you very much, Arcadio. Um, we actually have questions for all of you. So uh, I'm going to start maybe with uh, Feridon. Uh, you have two questions, Feridon. 
One of them is um, if uh, the nuclear power generation that shut down in California would have worked, would they have had the problem they had in August? That's one question. And then another question concerning policy is, um, say, uh, do federal laws have any competence statewide? Like, say, uh, what's the role of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission when it comes to state regulation? Uh, like, uh, do they have a say in Texas uh, from what happened there? Okay, excellent. Both good questions. I saw one in the chat. Uh, California used to have... Uh, some years ago, four operating reactors, two of them were closed uh, because they were not performing well. We only have two left. And frankly, the utility that operates them, PG&E, is planning to shut them down in 2025 because going forward, they did an analysis and they found out, this is really bizarre, they found out that nuclear actually because it's base load and cannot fluctuate up and down, becomes less and less useful and less and less profitable over time. So PG&E, based, based on that and a number of other issues, because it has to spend a lot of money to upgrade the two plants, announced that they were going to shut them down. So this is happening at a time that we need more uh, low carbon energy resources. So I think it's a, it's a, we could have a seminar on the future role of nuclear, but it's in, in my, seminars. It's kind of unfortunate that at, at the time that we need low carbon, we are in fact uh, shutting down nuclear reactors. The second question had to do with uh, FERC. You know, as I think as David pointed out, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has a far less active role in, um, you know, in telling which market should do what. In case of California, it does regulate California ISO. In case of ERCOT and Ross can comment, because Texas operates more or less as an island, FERC has no jurisdiction over Texas. So Texas ERCOT is uh, you know, regulated by, by politics within the state of Texas. In California, there's been a talk about expanding the market and bringing in the entire Western region into a, that energy imbalance market, which I showed in one of the slides. Maybe that's the future, but there's politics involved because people in neighboring states uh, do not necessarily like the 100% renewable future that California is pushing. So there are states like Utah and uh, uh, Montana and Wyoming and others, they, they still like to operate coal-fired plants forever if they can. So there's some, there's some political issues and uh, it, I think Europe maybe has a better system because you have the European Commission uh, telling individual states what what they have to do in America, it FERC cannot do that very actively, at least in my view. Half of the U.S. not not maybe half, but something like forty percent of the uh, population of state. There's no organized competitive market, so FERC and FERC cannot force those states to to organize one. You know, it can encourage them, but it cannot tell them what to do. So it's a different, uh, it's a different way of uh, thinking about markets and so forth. I think David, <laughs> David is smiling probably at this, at this comment. So I'll stop at that. Okay, thank you very much, Faridon. For Ross on Texas, they're asking you on on the financial repercussion that the the blackouts um, had in Texas. Uh, if if it had any implication for PPAs and for tax equity investors. Uh, will it impact, do you think, project financing for renewable energy projects in the USA? Um, is there litigation going on because of what happened uh, in February? I think you can come in lots about this relationship between FERC and, um, and your regulator. Oh, let me start with that, and then I'll, I'll, I'll go to Pablo, the question that Pablo mentioned. Uh, indeed, as Perry, Perry mentioned, 
Uh, FERC does not have the same jurisdiction in ERCOT, in the ERCOT part of Texas, as it does in the rest of the states. It does have some jurisdiction on the asynchronous ties, but basically has no um, uh, wholesale regulatory jurisdiction within Texas. It does have wholesale uh, uh, jurisdiction outside of Texas, but as Perry indicated, the ability to twist the arm of many states is quite is of states is quite limited. So within Texas, both wholesale and retail trade is handled by the Public Utility Commission, which has historically been thought of as an advantage in ability to do things within Texas. Although I think our February event probably casts some doubt on that. So then turning to the to the question, I think the question kind of conveys that renewables were the problem. Uh, and and I'd, I'd like to very strongly point out that although uh, wind produced a little bit less than was expected during the cold event, um, the majority of the supply interruptions were thermal, ge were thermal generation. So if anything, it's going to affect going forward how we think about uh, PPAs and other things for thermal generation as much if not more than uh, for renewables. Um, then the other, the other specific question is, is there going to be a ton of litigation or a ton of litigation, I should imagine, in the European Union? Um, in fact, there already is. Uh, ERCOT itself has apparently 20 or 30 uh, legal suits against it. Uh, there have been several bankruptcies. Uh, there's lots of parties suing lots of other parties. So not only will there be litigation, we already know there's litigation going on. I think generally that's likely to have an effect on contracting. I don't think it will necessarily, in his an opinion, uh, be more difficult for renewables versus thermal, but the tax equity investor issue has been affected, for example, by changes in tax rates in the US and so forth. So there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of moving parts in the tax equity uh, side of renewable investment that I think have already been changing quite apart from uh, our, our, our big event. Okay, thanks very much, Ross. Um, David, uh, there is a question about uh, the grid about the transmission companies, how should they invest in the grid in the future based on more flexibility, more interconnected regions? Uh, then the, the person who asks the question says, uh, demand is still flat, but more reliability is requested. And also they ask you if in Europe, the quality of the grid uh, is strong and resilient say in, in all countries, since it's all uh, with the internal market interconnected. So, sorry, Pablo, the last question, uh, there's a part... The, the last question is, is if, if the grid is resilient and strong in all European countries. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see, uh, what's the need of for the future for the grid? Of course, uh, flexibility is clear, no? In times where we, we are going to, um, to a very unpredictable um, generation, uh, flexibility and interconnection together with uh, with uh, storage seems to be the clue no? and if we go only to to grid the, the clue is of course uh, flexibility how do you how do you make a flexible network um, well at the end is something you have to handle in a in a weekly monthly basis no uh, trying to, to prevent, uh, trying to get ready for any event, trying to accommodate uh, maintenance and everything in the, in the moments where the grid is less needed and, and, and trying to use, at the end, try to use, actually, I think that the, the fact uh, is trying to use the grid as much as you can, the same as generation, no? You say, okay, so I have wind, I have solar, like it was shown at the beginning, very beginning of the webinar, solar is in the middle of the day. Okay, so what do I do with that? I have a storage, I can export. So the grid at the same is the same because uh, you need to maintain the grid. And, and when do you do it? You do it the best moments in terms of less needed. So that's probably the flexibility of the grid. 
of course, uh, HVDC or, or, or facts are also, are also very good uh, options. And then going to, to the reliability, I think reliability across Europe is, is similar, if not exactly the same. Another question is that the, the countries in the periphery are, are less connected because we are outside. I mean, it's clear. You know, some, probably in the north, the connection is very good. Here in the south, well, Italy is very good, but, but the Iberian Peninsula is, is weak connected, uh, especially if you compare with the peak demand. I don't know if that answers the questions. Yeah. Okay, thank you, David. And uh, David, a uh, couple of questions for you also. Um, let me find them. Uh, one of them is how can renewable curtailment be avoided so that the surplus energy can be used? And then um, you mentioned that we need new forms of energy, energy markets and new system. Would you say nowadays the, the European market is the most efficient one? And is there another market in another country? Well, you mentioned Australia, which has a good uh, combining market uh, policy. Is there anywhere we can look into so we can learn from them? Well, I mean, on the first question, I think the answer is almost certainly going to be a combination of storage and, uh, and demand flexibility, but, but primarily storage. And I think if you look at, at uh, you know, almost certainly at Spain, but I'm sure all countries now that are dealing with, with extremely large, uh, uh, it's very high penetration of renewables, they're now looking at ways to store the electricity. And apart from what I would call the sort of standard ones like pump storage um, and, and batteries, which are relatively short lived storage, I think we're now talking about long term storage, possibly hydrogen. And I think that hydrogen may be, if you want to see this, the silver bullet, which just might uh, enable not just storage for a few days or, or, or multiple days, but e even between seasons. So I think that's where we're moving. And, and, the, and I'm not aware of any, what I would call market-based uh, decisions, which are leading to large scale storage of that kind, almost certainly some kind of policy decision support is going to be needed. And it may well be through, through uh, capacity markets. In terms of other um, countries, well, no country has yet figured out how to do this. I have to say, I don't think that there's, a, oh yeah, we'll just go do what Australia is doing. But there are some interesting experiments. And, and the one I mentioned related to Australia is interesting, not because they've solved it. It's the first time they're doing it. But the idea that you start, instead of having a capacity market for for you know for capacity sorry a market for capacity a market for energy then another one for storage and having multiple and another one for renewables you start thinking about these as being integrated and thinking how can one actually design uh, combinations of these different resources so that they fit one another and I think that's a, an interesting experiment worth worth developing the other the other thing that I think is very interesting and you see it in the UK. I suspect it could develop in, in, in throughout uh, Europe, and that is where um, commercial opportunities are being offered uh, specifically for at times when renewables are operating. So the, the, the market model which I support with, with colleagues is one which specifically encourages consumers to consume when the renewables are operating, and, and it discourages them from consuming when the system requires backup especially fossil fuel backup. Now, as you say, there are a number of commercial opportunities now where price of electricity is extremely low if the consumers consume it when the renewables are operating. And we've seen these commercial opportunities and I think that at the very least we should be using um, the, the markets that we have to encourage this. And th by the way, that means that those consumers who buy during those periods of time do not pay capacity payments, they do not pay for some of the peak requirements of the system because they're not using them. So the idea is to try and distinguish uh, between those, uh, uh, if you want, energy um, purchases which don't use, uh, don't put strain on the system or on the energy market and those that do put strain on the system. And by separating them, that's basically where I see the, the, the if you want, the way forward. Okay, thank you, David. Okay, Arcadio, we have a couple of more questions, but uh, maybe we can send them to the speakers or I think we can uh, we can introduce these two to, to the our speakers from Texas. No, there are two questions or one thing about 
the, the, the top of 9,000 megawatts, no? Uh, that sounds euros per megawatt or something about ROS, no? Have to see the, the question? Uh, what, what it says, Ross, is uh, if there are no mechanisms to, to suspend the market in situations such as those experienced, so prices don't get to reach up to $9,000 uh, megawatt. And then there's another one. Uh, you're muted, Ross. Uh, maybe I can do the, the second one also, which says, uh, what is your opinion about the current legislative proposal bills made in Texas regarding the obligation on renewable energy sources to purchase ancillary services, and if do you expect any further changes in the air code market design? In Too many draws. <laughs> mainly capacity markets. So uh, I'll try this very quickly. Uh, the, the, the question that says prices of $9,000 per megawatt hour are nonsense. I, I respectfully disagree. Uh, that price level is to reflect the uh, value of uh, involuntary curtailment. Uh, and, and when it occurs for an hour or two, uh, pursuant to a normal uh, rolling blackout, I think it's a not not unacceptable thing to do. Of course, 50 or 60 hours is unacceptable. I 100% agree with that. There there was this circuit breaker mechanism, uh, which 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 dealt with accumulated hours. But I think we need a separate mechanism that deals with contiguous hours that says. You, we're not going to set the price like this for more than two or three hours straight. And I think, I think that is very much lacking from our current market design. And I think there will be rethinking of that. Um, there's another question about uh, what's my opinion about legislative proposal bills regarding um, energy resources to purchase ancillary services. Um, all ancillary services in ERCOT are charged load uh, hitherto. If we were to say that um, the wind and the solar needs to purchase ancillary services for the ancillary services that it causes, then we need to ask large thermal generators to pay for uh, responsive or spinning reserves because they are the ancillary services that they cause. So I think there's a certain amount of uh, double standard or even hypocrisy in the bill that's trying to hit renewables uh, to, to serve an agenda that's anti-renewable as opposed to dealing with the particulars of the blackout, which was not primarily due to renewables. So I, I think that, that those bills are unhelpful. They might go ahead, but they're unhelpful, okay? Are we gonna have few further changes in ERCOT? Yes, I, there will be. Will there be a capacity market? I think that's a, on the cards as a possibility for, uh, possibility, uh, but I, I, I don't know that I would predict it at this point. Thank you very much, I think Ross. That was two minutes. Perry, one minute more to add at the end? No, I think, thank you again for uh, the invitation. It was, it was great. I, I learned a lot from my colleagues, uh, Ross and David and the other David. It's good to uh, exchange notes and learn from each other. I think we're all in, we're all in this together, and we there's a lot we can learn from each other. So okay. thank you again for organizing, and uh, I thought it was well done. Thank you. Thank here, you. Here, here. Very, very much so. Thank you. Per, uh, David, something to add? There are a, a question there. The the, the model, no, about the model, but this is uh, another discussion, no. Uh, about the what? Sorry? About the model between, uh, I think something David said about the, uh, the model of, uh, of TSO. No? Ah, well, I think... It's I another think different we, discussion. Yeah, it's a different discussion, but <laughs> in this discussion, in the discussion of, 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 of incidents, I think that the answer is clear. No. The most, uh, you have to be together. If you want to solve things fast, you have to be together. Other question but, is other issues. <laughs> so, something to add to the end of this uh, webinar? Uh, not, not really. It was it was fun to participate and, and, and thank you to invite me. Okay, thank you, David. Your final word. No, thank you very much for the invitation. I enjoyed it very much and agree with 
as I always do with, with Ferdinand. Oh, a pleasure. It's a, a pleasure of having all of you here. Thank you very much for participating and thank you very much to people who were here at 6 p.m. Uh, uh, hearing this, uh, this conversation. Thank you very much, all of you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Ross. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, David. Bye, everybody. Thank you very much to Anna Club. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.